This is Mile High. We have to do it better in order to move people along. Up, down, inside out. If you get your mind right, it is not. It is a receiver of thought. Because love is my first technique. It's now time for the show. Hello and welcome to the Mile High Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Daniel Knowles, coming you from coming at you from an altitude of 5280 and um, in Boulder, Colorado. And I want to first of all thank people for being subscribers. The Mile High Podcast is now going really around the world. You can find it on iTunes and Stitcher, and of course on Facebook and as well as Google and YouTube. Um, and I uh, also want to remind people to subscribe. If you're enjoying these podcasts, subscribe, share them with your friends. We want more people to get connected to true chiropractic messages to impact the chiropractic profession for the better. And today's guest, I am very glad to get some time, one, to have on the podcast, but also some time to connect um, because we're old friends and go way back, which is none other than the one and only Dr. Patrick Gentempo, who almost needs no introduction. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Patrick. Hey, I'm, I'm really happy to be here, uh, and I'm at 7,200 feet. Well, there <laughs> so, you go. You're a mile and a half. I guess I'm a mile and a half, uh, so this, this could be the, mi the mile and a half uh, high uh, <laughs> podcast today. <laughs> Excellent. So so between great to be with you. Uh, I'm, looking forward to I'm sorry, say it again? Between the two of us, we have a lot of altitude going. We have a lot of altitude, so we have a good context to be able to uh, talk about things. Excellent. And um, first of all, I want to thank you for being part of Mile High. We look forward to having you come out this year, August 17th to 20th. It's going to be phenomenal. We're going into our fifth year. Um, and one of the things that a lot of people may not know about you that I want to start out with is that you've been a big supporter. We go back 10 years, 15 years to some of our political efforts in Colorado. Um, when we had issues with the state board and instrumentation, you came out and helped with that. And also other conferences we had before is Mile High um, when we had the Colorado Chiropractic Wellness Alliance. So I want to thank you for your involvement in all those things, um, first of all, and let's start out with why you would do something like that. Why are politics important in chiropractic? Well, um, it's eminently important, and uh, I spent a lot of my career running around to varying state associations or state uh, um, board meetings, having to argue certain points. Uh, I played a role in the on the national political level and international political level um, because it requires people who have a context of, of philosophy and principles uh, to be able to make the intellectual arguments for uh, the shape of the profession. It's, it's understand what politics is. Uh, number one, it, politics is a branch of philosophy. So if people recoil and they hear the word philosophy and say, well, it has nothing to do with politics, that's a very ignorant statement to make, um, and, which incidentally, a lot of people who are in politics and chiropractic don't understand uh, philosophy. They make those types of ignorant statements. And as the old saying goes, uh, and I wish I can give attribution, uh, just because you don't take an interest in politics doesn't mean politics doesn't take an interest in you. <laughs> so as much as you may be excited about the virtues of chiropractic, the principles of chiropractic, the impact it can have on people's lives, uh, it is a shirking of responsibility to not take political action when the values that you practice as a chiropractor are being threatened or opposed. And uh, I, you know, I have a, a special um, expertise and, and, and I guess gift in, in the realm of philosophy where I'm able to really sort through issues, uh, understand contradictions, point them out and argue for uh, certain political positions. So, uh, and so what is politics? You know, politics is morality uh, applied to social functions. So if, if it's chiropractic politics, it's, it's the morality for a chiropractor, an individual, you might say here is uh, my value set and how I want to behave as a chiropractor. Uh, and when you apply that to social functions as a chiropractor, you're now in the realm of politics. So it, it, it's essential that the right people take hold. I mean, if there wasn't political activity by people who had the right um, understanding, uh, you know, you'd, you'd see a, a profession right now that was indistinguishable from, from medicine, uh, except for the fact that I probably would practice it very poorly. Uh, so 
Um, you know, so it is it is principle and, and the political applications of those principles that preserves the uniqueness of chiropractic as being a non-duplicating profession uh, that keeps drugs and prescriptive rights outside of chiropractic as a, you know, because that is the practice of medicine and something that is not the practice of chiropractic. Uh, so there, there's a an ongoing vigilance that's required and quite frankly, I've been doing it a lot of years. I wish uh, you know there'd be more people that would uh, you know uh, get involved so I can uh, take some political time down. But uh, my political activism is still pretty big today, uh, and it's an issue of conscience for me. Where I'll show up at, at certain places that I think are you know uh, critical leverage points uh, that uh, something needs to be said, and there's got to be some competency in in, in the intellectual arguments that are being made in order for this to uh, you know, the principles that we know and love to be preserved on a political level. So maybe it was more of an answer than you were looking for, but that's why I do it. Well, no, and that's exactly it. And I'm grateful that you've done that for us in Colorado numerous times. And also um, because when I was just graduated from school and went to Total Solution way back in the day, you talking about that and outlining it really lit that fire for me. So I also want to you know tell you I'm grateful for that. I want people to understand that you know how much part you've played in inspiring in many people in terms of that concept. Now um, I was looking through your bio and I noticed that we shared something else in common, which is the Northeast uh, raised uh, Italian Catholic family. So <laughs> that's uh, the that same thing. You cut me and it's olive oil coming out. So that's right. um, okay, let's let people know you a little bit better that may not know you. Uh, can you share a little bit about your, your, your journey into chiropractic? Yeah, and, and I'll share, you know, I said I was at 7,200 feet, uh, at, I'm in Utah, and I got to tell you, I, I'm yet to find a good Italian store to go to on a Sunday morning in Utah, so it's a, it's a problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm flying back to Jersey tomorrow, just, and I, I can't wait, I'll be going straight to Hoboken uh, to, you know, to get, 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 what I, get my fix. But, uh, so, um, my journey in chiropractic uh, started when I was a teenager. Um, I, uh, you know, the short story is I, I had a wrestling injury. Um, I was a medical failure uh, with response to this injury with uh, muscle relaxers, painkillers, anti-inflammatories, uh, not not helping me. Uh, my mother, who has a lot of uh, wisdom and intuition, said we need something different, and brought me to a chiropractor, who did an evaluation, adjusted me, and. After that first adjustment, I was like 90% better from you know what I could, you know what my symptomatic experience was at least, and uh, but proceeded. The guy was a one year. I, I went to Dr. Dick Santos' practice, which was near me in New Jersey, and his associate at the time, Dr. Bob Natush, uh, was a year out of Palmer, and uh, you know as I go in for subsequent visits, he started telling me the chiropractic story, and I you know I I, I like to cite BJ's quote that. You never know how far reaching something you may think, do or say today will affect the lives of millions tomorrow. Uh, here was this guy who brown bagged it, you know, new associate, you know, uh, you know, brown bagged lunch. And, you know, he said, well, why don't you sit with me while I have my sandwich and I'll you know, tell you about the whole story of chiropractic. And I literally, after that 45 minute conversation, I walked out of that office different than I walked in, meaning I heard the story and it was what I refer to as that pivotal experience that I decided at that moment that I was going to be a chiropractor. So, uh, and, I, and I say that because a lot of times people, um, especially if they're new in practice, if they're associates, whatever, they don't feel like they can have influence. And, uh, you know, fast forward when I was running CLA and <clears throat> we had literally maybe seven, eight, nine thousand clients on six continents, 55 employees. Uh, that chiropractor who had now been in practice for a lot of years and was a, you know, a veteran, still practiced in New Jersey, his son became one of our clients. I said, I looked at the last name, I said, is your father Bob? He said, yeah. So he still practiced? Yeah, in New Jersey. I said, you know, I, I called him up, I invited him to the office, and literally he came in and he was looking around. I was telling him about the work we were doing. He, you know, he saw this, you know, we were at 12,000 square feet in a big glass building and, and you know, a lot of activity going on and uh, you know, th things in the wall that would describe our story what we were doing in the world and um I, I just remember him looking around you know with tears coming down his face i said you know you probably don't even remember the conversation you know and he said no i don't and i said well i just want you to know that because you took the time to talk to a little teenage boy who had an interest in what you were doing this is the result and uh it was it was a very poignant moment um you know to to have that experience for me and for him 
And uh, and isn't it interesting? Again, it, for him, it was a incidental conversation. You know, just on another day at, at the office. For me, it was transformational. Right. Um, I think that we chiropractors miss that a lot. Uh, there's those opportunities every day, but when you're too caught up in your own stuff, uh, you stop looking around to see where you can have legacy impact. Uh, so I'm hoping that maybe a takeaway for everybody who would watch this would would maybe recognize that they could maybe they could become more present to what's going on around them, and that by doing so, there's impact you could be having that could be incalculable. So um, so I I decided after leaving my office uh, that office to become a chiropractor. I went to Life. Um, I went right in out of school. I was youngest uh, high school. I went to you know two years undergrad at the time, right into chiropractic school. Youngest guy to graduate in my class. Uh, graduated March of '83 and got into practice um, and started my practice in Georgia, but then uh, moved it to New Jersey. Um, and then uh, while I was in practice, that's when we started developing technology with Dr. Chris Kent. We were also teaching board review seminars and we had other activities in the profession. And I was, you know, I was a, a brazen twenty-something, you know, who felt like, uh, you know, everything is possible and that there's urgent work to do, <laughs> and uh, you know, didn't know what I didn't know. So I, I had the uh, the gonads to to attempt things that uh, you know a lot of people maybe would have had a lot of caution around. Uh, but hell, I was a chiropractor. I didn't care. What people <laughs> <thought>. So <clears throat> so I ended up. Um, you know, we developed this uh, the Insight technology, uh, which has been very popularized. Uh, and, uh, you know, built that company over a period of many years. I sold CLA uh, about five years ago. And now I have my holding company, Action Potential Holdings. And we have about seven or eight different uh, investments right now that we're working on in, in varying aspects of, of chiropractic and healthcare. Uh, just launched one of them now, uh, the Vaccines Revealed uh, series, which uh, was a, a, maybe the most successful thing I've done in a short term process, an eight week sprint. Uh, that reached around the world, engaged millions of people, and uh, you know brought the vaccine issue to light. It was like a magic carpet ride. <clears throat> and what's interesting is, uh, you know, through the process, I was called a baby killer and a conspiracy theorist, and so on. But I got to tell you, it was some of the most fun work I've ever done in my whole life, uh, and it had it had a major impact. So it, it, to me, it's all about taking on issues. Um, don't be afraid to be polarizing, and uh, just have a strong purpose involved. And you'll see that uh, your career could be never ending. God knows mine doesn't seem to be, I feel like I'm just getting started in many ways. Well, and, and that's something, what you said there goes into the crux of what we want to talk about, which is philosophy, because in your history, you had a time where you discovered philosophy, you felt like your life was a little off purpose, and then philosophy helped guide that. So, so why is philosophy so important? Well, that's true. Um, it took me getting hit by a truck. Uh, you know, the, the story, I don't want to take up the whole time, but I was in uh, Manhattan at the time. I was um, I was out of practice. I was between two practices. Uh, There's all these other uh, interesting opportunities that happened for me. I ended up on, on TV and uh, and this TV appearance went very successful. Next thing you know, I had um, you know agents calling me and they were putting movie scripts and TV scripts in my hands and I'm running around and I'm, you know, I'm reading for different things. and. Um, and I was on my way to acting class one morning, I got hit by a truck <laughs> and, uh, literally put me on my back. I was very depressed. My leg was broken a couple of places, had a head, head injury. And, um, uh, you know, so I, I was laying there just feeling like, geez, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, this whole new world was unfolding to me. And, uh, and I was, you know, somewhat depressed and I started to think to myself, you know, maybe this is a wake up call, you know, I was in the wrong direction. And as it, I could say now with the, the, the years of my life and the experience I've had that uh, I'm quite certain that most tragedies um, are blessings that uh, need to be unwrapped in some way, shape or form if you, if you spend enough time processing it. Uh, and then I had a friend you know, who came over with a book about that thick called The Fountainhead and said, it doesn't look like you go anywhere, maybe you want to read this. So I, I read it and uh, that's what got, you know, that, fic that philosophy fiction novel by Ayn Rand is what got me started in in wanting to understand and learn philosophy because I then I read the Fountainhead and then I started digging into philosophy, the branches of philosophy, their application in life, and I became what I refer to as a as an applied philosopher, and not an academic philosopher, but an applied philosopher. How do you apply philosophy to life? And uh, what most people don't understand is the relationship between philosophy and your brand as a chiropractor. And, and as you know, I, my talk I just gave recently at Calgium, which 
uh, several elements of I'll be I'll be bringing in mile high. You know, my A game's coming there, so people should show up. It's going to be uh, you know I always shoot for a pivotal experience, and I'm I'm very amped up to get there and to give this talk. Uh, and it's going to be some really good fresh material. Uh, but it's uh, your your stand is your brand. You know where it's uh, if your philosophy is weak. It means your uh, your your uh, yeah your thinking is weak, which means your communications are weak, which means your brand is weak, which means your practice is weak. You know, so it all starts with the philosophy as the foundation, and if that's not set, if that's not strong, if that's not structured, if that's not clear, then it has all these downstream effects, and it, and it manifests ultimately as a practice that's a struggle, that's a burnout, that's no fun, that struggles financially. Uh, you know, that's off purpose and all those types of things. So your philosophy leads to your purpose, which is going to lead to your communications, which is going to lead to your brand and your brand message, your brand image, which is going to lead to your practice expression and outcomes. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be uh, at the program. You know, my intent is is to really pull these things together and, and give people a practical. Again, it's about practical application. I'm an entrepreneur. You know, I, I like starting businesses that succeed and profit. Um, and I like leading chiropractors to do the same. So uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to basically pull together these elements and say, the, isn't it exciting? These principles of chiropractic, great. But let's talk about how this turns into your brand and how you, how it makes millions of dollars for your practice because that's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, so uh, so that that's why you know my intention is uh, that I plan on at the program. Uh, but philosophy, you know, I I'm so I guess I could say in hindsight, what a blessing for me to get hit by this truck. It put me on again another pivotal experience. It put me on a path that I otherwise was not on, and it got me learning about something that not only I needed but the world desperately needs now more than ever. And uh, I'm I'm really excited to be able to continue to um, uh, to bring this to chiropractors and uh, and have them literally be able to make immediate changes as a byproduct of what I teach them. You know, it's very interesting how you've laid that out between philosophy going all the way to brand because most people don't make that connection. And I will tell you, I've noticed that more and more outside of chiropractic and other businesses from restaurants to gyms, you know, that they make sure their philosophy and who they are comes through what they're doing. And so the, the concept of an applied philosophy is very important. Yeah, it, it is. Um, my challenge is that philosophy is like chiropractic. You know, the people hear the word and they think the wrong things. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and it, you know, so it's just completely misbranded. And people look at philosophy as some kind of an abstract intellectual exercise, which it can be on the academic side. But they all fail to see the profound, profound practical applications of leading a successful life through philosophy, building a successful business through philosophy. So everybody, you, you watch this right now, you have a philosophy. You have no choice about the fact that you have philosophy. The only, the, really, the only choice is are you going to define it in a conscious, rational, disciplined way where you can apply it for your benefit, or are you can let it accumulate from your mother's, father's, teacher's, preacher's, as Ayn Rand said, like a junk keeping your subconscious, uh, you know, that, that's creating chaos in your life rather than production. Yeah. And so then that relate that pretty much outlines the relationship between philosophy and practice success. Yeah, I mean that's that's exactly what it is. I mean the relationship between philosophy and practice success is inextricable, um, and and one leads to the other. The philosophy is the cause. The success is the effect. And this is what people need to understand. When people are really strong on purpose, you know, per, you don't get hit with a purpose stick. Purpose comes from something. It comes from your philosophy, your view of reality, your theory of knowledge. I mean, all the things that are in the branches that I teach, but. Um, but ultimately, its philosophy goes to your purpose, which goes to your psychology, which goes to your procedures, which then goes to your prosperity, the, the, the full outcome. So the, the practical application of, of philosophy mandates this sequence of thinking that leads to a particular outcome that has extraordinary uh, benefits uh, as far as, uh, you know, not, not even just monetarily, but spiritually, um, uh, financially. You know, it, it, it has been, you know, it has the outcomes that affect, you know, everything in your life. It's not a matter of saying, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that have happened into money that are pretty miserable. And that's because they, they were one of those rare outliers that through some sort of uh, luck and circumstances were able to generate cash or inherit cash. 
uh, but they never really had a purpose that led them there, so they can't really enjoy the wealth that they have. But you take somebody like, you know, a, a Michael Jordan, like one of the things I say, if you look at Michael Jordan, uh, you know, how many $40 million Nike contracts do you need before you can, you know, stop playing basketball? Or, uh, you know, or Bill Gates was worth $50 billion. Now, I mean, I don't like what his foundation is doing, but you're putting that aside. $50 billion, he was still going to work every day as the chief software architect. So if $50 billion can't buy you out of your purpose, nothing can. And But you have to understand the $50 billion was the effect of his purpose, not the cause of it. You see, and that's that's when people finally wrap their heads around that, they get on purpose. <laughs> you know, if, you know I, I appeal to the greed gland. You know, if, if I can't get you there any other way, greed should get you there. And, uh, and you start to realize that being on purpose and, and finding your spiritual purpose that uh, that's uh, driving your career uh, is is the uh, the path to be able to create success and generate money. And it's the kind of thing if I were to give you five million dollars right now, and you know, for most chiropractors, they quit practice. Yeah, and that's why they'll never. That, that's why they will never have five million dollars. You see, so the idea is that that five million dollars is the effect. And if if five million dollars meant to you, well, I. Expand my practice. I'd I'd, I'd uh, increase uh, you know maybe open up new practices. I'd, I'd increase my marketing budgets. If the, if the money becomes a means of expanding the range of your purpose, uh, then you know you'll you'll attract to you. My premise on this is that you'll attract to you the material wealth proportional to the strength of your spiritual purpose. And you know all this comes from an underlying philosophy. So you know I'd love to say that you know people can master this in, in a half hour or an hour. You can. I've been working on it for over 30 years, and I'm still working on it. But you, you know the journey of a, a thousand miles starts with a single step. Take the first step, and you start to see things improve along the way. Uh, and you'd be surprised for connecting dots that um, many times people have so many of these pieces together, but if they just would connect the dots. It all, you see it all fall together. Uh, so anyway, so I, th this is why I still have an excitement about going out and speaking live. I've really cut my, my schedule a lot. Uh, so I'm not, and uh, you know, I'm probably about 30, per I probably turned down 70% of the speaking invitations I get at this point. Uh, so I, I'm really, um, you know, picking the right platforms at the right time, which is why I'm at mile high. Uh, you know, we, we had an enthusiastic yes there because we know that it's the right purpose behind that event, the right energy is there, uh, and it's something that uh, that I, I love to participate in. I can also tell you that uh, sometimes I'm invited to platforms where I know it's a hostile environment. Um, I was just at one, I won't mention the name, uh, you know, but uh, you know the, the guy uh, who uh, was, the, was the president of the organization before I went up, and it was a pretty big convention, he's like, you know, thanks for coming. He goes, this was his way of encouraging me. He said, you know, I know we were getting a lot of uh, a lot of complaints and a lot of people really upset by the fact that we invite you to come speak here. But uh, but I really think they need to hear your message. <laughs> that was his encouragement. <laughs> <Don't get it. laughs> and, and quite frankly, it worked. It fired me up, man. I, I, and I had four hours. So I gave him four hours of like right between the eyes. Uh, so that was actually turned out to be a lot of fun for me. But so, you know, I, it's you know, it's fun to, to you know as the the uh, characterization goes preach to the converted but uh, sometimes you really have to go where you needed most as compared to where you're loved most <laughs> so uh, so I go for those those events sometimes too <laughs> depends depends on the mood there <laughs> <laughs> well you know I guess and this is what's important you know for folks everybody's watching. You know, what role do you think confidence and certainty plays, right? In other words, when I get invited to those things, I, I'm, I have such confidence in my thinking and such certainty about my premises and conclusions that I have no inhibition about walking into those adversarial circumstances and, and getting up and being, you know, one against many as far as the you know, potential conflict. And I'm not like, I'm not like one of these guys who likes conflict. As a matter of fact, I really don't like conflict at all. I try to, you know, I, and as I try to avoid it, I'll, I'll, I'll address it when I need to, but it's not like, there's some people who thrive on conflict. I'm not one of those. I'm, I'm much more the opposite. I, I am a peacemaker. I like to move towards harmony and balance, but when the conflict is necessary, I don't shy away from it. 
And, uh, and this is what philosophy breeds. It breeds confidence and certainty. But when you're a fuzzy chiropractor with a fuzzy philosophy where you you got one foot in medicine and one foot in something else and you're trying to make sense of it and, and you're trying to make recommendations and you're, you're putting together cases and, and you're trying to get people to accept you know, the, your, the case that, you know, that, that you're presenting for them and you know, all these kinds of things you want to get off of insurance, whatever the things are. If you don't have that strength of confidence, then you could, that's where you end up in that very mediocre practice. So this is why philosophy is important. There's nothing, certainty comes from your clarity of thought. And if you're th your thinking's not clear, then you don't have certainty. And you, you, clarity and thinking comes from philosophy. So it all roads lead back to Rome here, you know, right. uh, for us Italians. So, uh, <laughs> so it's... So yeah, you know, that it's just the nature of, of what it's all about. So when you know when people say, "Why are you so passionate about philosophy? Why 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 are you such a zealot about it?" Because I understand the the fundamental nature of philosophy and what it means to human beings, and especially chiropractors. Well, and as I said, I've I've seen you in that like state board environment, which could be <laughs> hostile and be cool as a cucumber and very clear and very empowered and certain about what it is that you were sharing. Um, and, and again, not necessarily, you know, that is one of the strengths of building your philosophy, your understanding and, and your thought process. And, and it goes out to so many different areas. So um, we touched on it, but can you explain a little bit more what applied philosophy is? So applied philosophy is saying that you're, you're utilizing philosophy uh, and the structures of philosophical thinking and applying them to your life. In other words, academic philosophy could be a couple of guys sitting you know, together on a weekend and talking about Aristotelian logic and, and pl platonic metaphysics and, you know, uh, the way that these guys saw things in antiquity, which is what most people think philosophy is, you know, when they hear the word. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and you can look at these things and say, well, you know, very interesting, uh, you know, it's stimulating intellectual con uh, um, conversation. It's very abstract uh, in nature. But for people who are academically or intellectually inclined, which I, I would put myself at least in, in one of those categories, um, I, uh, you know, it, it's something that's fun. And but then at the end, you know, it's like, OK, that was Sunday afternoon. Monday, I'm back to my normal life, and whatever we talked about really doesn't have any applicability. Mm. Applied philosophy is saying, what is the sequence of, uh, what's the structure for thinking, the sequence of thinking between metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics, and aesthetics, these five branches? What are my own premises that I operate from? Why do I hold those premises? And therefore, what am I going to do about them, which is what I call the philosophy formula, which is the course I teach on it. And, uh, and incidentally, if anybody wants, I have three free videos on this so that you can dig deeper into the applied philosophy because it's hard to cover it all here. If you go to philosophyformula.com, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. You can get those videos and you can learn more about it. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the idea of saying I'm going to actually utilize these branches of philosophy, like I, I spoke about uh, platonic uh, metaphysics. Well, metaphysics is the first branch of philosophy. You have a metaphysics, too. So we can look at you know, uh, Plato's view of, of, of reality and the, the ultimate view of reality, that the reality that you and I perceive is not actual reality, but a warped representation of true reality because, uh, you know, the, the evidence of the senses and, and the rational mind warp what is really out there. I mean, you can get into all that stuff and you might say, oh, that's kind of interesting that Plato thought that as compared to Aristotle, which had, you know, had a different view, but that doesn't apply to your life. But I'm saying you could take metaphysics and I'm saying you have metaphysical premises about chiropractic, about practice, about health and where it comes from, etc. Uh, you have you have metaphysical premises about money and about the exchange of money and values. You have most chiropractors contradictions uh, between their uh, you know, providing humanitarian service and having to make a profit. These are philosophical issues that if you don't get those sorted out, you're screwed. So, so the idea, you know, it, yeah, so the whole idea is the practical application of the branches of philosophy in your life. And the foundation, you know, foundational premise that got me here was the first one I heard from Rand, where she said that contradictions in your basic philosophical premises will lead to destruction. And the amount of destruction is relative to the level of the contradiction. So the whole idea 
is to work through and identify contradictions, remove them, and then you evolve to higher levels of success. You know, it's interesting, that contradiction concept, you made me think of one that I just experienced, well, last year, so it was I had a patient that came to see me, and her dad was a chiropractor, and her dad was a chiropractor in the 20s, so she was a senior patient, and she brought in these old Palmer newsletters, and it was really, I was like, this is awesome, and she was getting care from us, and um, she says to me, I, I said to her, why did your dad stop practicing? Because he said he stopped practicing and went on to something else, and she said, well, at the time, and, and this has to go back to the 30s or something, he, 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 he had a challenge with charging people for a health care service. Mm -hmm. That was her yep. memory of what he said of why he stopped right? He couldn't charge people for something that was health related, which just seemed to me such a, tra a tragedy. I'm sure chiropractors struggle with that same concept today. They absolutely do. Um, and, and it is, I mean, the, in those free videos I mentioned earlier, um, the second video is on money. What's your philosophy of money? Because that's where it all comes from. And it's really the, the, the philosopher that promulgated altruism was uh, Immanuel Kant, at least he was the most effective one, the German philosopher. And in the Kantian ethics, because now we're in the realm of philosophy called ethics, um, in the Kantian ethics, uh, you know, his whole idea was that there was this moral imperative, is how he described it, you know, to, to serve others and to do it selflessly, meaning that there's no personal gain from doing so. And I believe that that is the underpinnings of, of a, uh, a major contradiction uh, that exists in humanity at large, that rather than the rational exchange of values, uh, you know, for services, that instead it's somebody is bad if they seek to earn a profit or make money you know from from the service they're providing but you know as i always said uh, you know the best way to help the poor is, is not be one of them not my original thought i heard it somewhere but the best way to help the poor is to not be one of them and uh, and and my my further comment on that is that you know no money no patients no money no <laughs> chiropractic you know so if you're not you know so what people do is they become marginally selfless where they they make just enough money to barely get by but not enough to really thrive, to expand a practice, to hire more staff, to do more marketing and do all the things that a business requires. So, uh, and, and the consequence of that is that they have a building resentment, you know, that, that happens and then they burn out and maybe they even leave practice. And that, that's very unfortunate, but that, that's a perfect example of how a, a philosophical contradiction can you know, lead to enormous destruction. In this case, probably a very gifted chiropractor who got into it for the right reasons as far as his love of the principles, who had to leave practice because he just couldn't get right in his own mind about money, exchanging money for his service. Yeah, yeah, and, and this is the kind of discussion that's so important, and I think people make a disconnect in chiropractic, and, and I, I hope you can comment on this, they think, that, oh, yes, I know philosophy, I study philosophy, I read the green books, or I can recite the 33 principles, so because I have those memorized, then I know philosophy. But there's actually no critical thinking going on. Right. <clears throat> that's exactly right. That's, that's the difference between philosophy and dogma. Right. So, yeah, so philosophy is critical thinking. Uh, dogma is uh, when, when you accept conclusions without understanding the thinking, <laughs> that brings one to those conclusions, that's called dogma. So, um, so an example that would be, I might say, uh, you know, a, a catchphrase, which is a strong premise, the power that made the body heals the body. Okay. Now, it's dogma if I just repeat that over and over again, I think it sounds kind of good. I don't have a philosophy around it unless I can write a, like a, a treatise on it, you know, like a, a, a whole document or maybe even a book on it because I, it has such deep implications. And that's the difference between philosophy and dogma. If you look at the 33 principles, you know, the, the, the major premise, there's the universal intelligence and all matter constantly giving to it its actions and properties, thereby maintaining it in existence. I actually was talking to somebody the other day, a non-chiropractor, um, who, uh, you know, we were in some kind of a discussion and looking at, uh, you know, universal principles and, and talking, you know, getting into maybe some quantum areas and so on. And, and he said, uh, you know, and I said that, premised him and he was like wow because he had a background to understand the implications of that so you don't it's not just a matter of saying oh well that's kind of cool universal intelligence innate intelligence it's really understanding the deep implication and meaning of all of those things and how they translate into a conclusion 
that when you're making recommendations to patients is present. <laughs> Right. You know what I'm saying? It's not, and that's where people, they separate the philosophy from, you know, the action. That's applied philosophy. If there is a universal intelligence and all matter constantly giving to its properties and actions, thereby maintaining it in existence, and we're talking about innate intelligence and organizational intelligence, and you, know, you look at the implications of entropy, which is disassociation, dis disintegration, uh, disorganization, you know, destruction, and then constructive forces, which are innate, which are within uh, you know, biological you know, beings, not just us, but bio any biological system's got an organizational intelligence. And, and you see how the, you know, the dance between uh, destruction and construction between these two things. And then you say, what role does the chiropractic adjustment play in all this? You know, when you start to understand the deeper implications of it all, you begin to realize that you have something special that's unique, that has value, uh, and that when you're making the recommendation as to why some, if I see, wow, here's universal intelligence, I'm seeing entropy in this person, they're, they're now suffering as a result of that. The body is not, you know, the innate organizational intelligence not being properly expressed. That is, uh, uh, you know, it's all modulated through the nervous system. I have ways of measuring this and assessing it, and I know that my adjustments can have an impact on all this. You start to connect the practical application of the chiropractic case, if you will, an adjustment to all of these abstract principles. Now you're in applied philosophy, not abstract philosophy. And, you know, as you said, you, you, this has been a journey for years and years and years for you. It's not an event. It's a process. You know, growing your philosophy is not that, oh, I, I read The Fountainhead. I know philosophy <laughs> or, or whatever. Uh, or I read Stevenson, so I've got it. You know, it's a process that goes through your whole life and then will continue to have impacts in your politics, in your finance, um, in your practice, your business and, and, and your relationships everywhere. That's right. And, and that's, and listen, you have a philosophy about parenting. You have a philosophy about love relationships. You have premises, you know, I say philosophy, you know, premises kind of one and saying the foundational philosophies that you hold. Uh, you have philosophy about money. You have philosophy about spirituality. You have philosophy about your health and fitness. You have philosophy about, you know, every important category of your life and it's driving it right now. And it's either driving it to a place you want to be or it's driving it to a place you don't want to be. But philosophy is driving your choices and actions, whether you know it or not. So if you begin to master philosophy, look at the impact that can have on your life in a positive way. And then not only your life, but the lives of other people that you, uh, you know, that rely on you. And if not, you're kind of living a life unexamined. <sighs> yeah, unexamined. And, or, yeah, and some people, maybe it's a partial examination. Uh, right. Uh, but and it's not anybody's fault. Nobody. Was, I mean, I'm self-taught. This is not taught in schools. This is not taught, you know, uh, in, in uh, you know, college. It's not taught in, in postgrad. You know, where people say, let's start to get to the root of it all, so that we can, you know, start to you know, apply our not only our thinking and conclusions, you know, to draw them, but to apply them to your actions in your life. And that's what the whole. That's what philosophy is all about. So. You know, it, it's it's a very interesting um, uh, journey that's never ending. You know, because you always have contradictions. Nobody's perfect, right? There's always there's always another level to get to, and it, it, you get there through your what I say. You, you know, it's your intellectual life, which is one of the most important categories of my life. And again, people here intellectual, they think it's something boring or routine. You know, it's it's anything but. It's 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 the you know you have this thing called a mind. You know, and this mind is your tool of achievement or your tool for destruction. Uh, so you decide how you want to use it. And you know, if you're, if you're, my premise is that you have a choice in the matter. You can make a decision right now to start engaging your mind on deeper levels and utilizing as a tool for your own uh, success and outcomes and joy, you know, and, and happiness. You know, if you're gonna ask my 15 year old daughter, what's the whole purpose of life? She'll tell you to be happy. Uh, but when you're living a bunch of contradictions and you have a cycle of chaos and destruction and to, if to you, you know, the universe is an incomprehensible chaos of, of uh, uh, um, uh, arbitrary uh, experiences, uh, you know, then, then that's, a, that's, a, that's a nightmare to live right. in every single day. Right. So to me, I, I think that it can be sorted out. I think you, your life can be self-directed. I think that you can find a purpose. You can organize that purpose. And as, uh, as uh, Napoleon Hill says in Think and Grow Rich, the world makes room for the person who knows where he or she is going.
he says he, but I'm trying to make it uh, <laughs> uh, you know, more politically correct. So for the person who knows where they're going, that is, uh, you know, that's why when you have purpose, you're moving and people get out of your way because you're so focused. But when you're wandering around, I always say, you ever go through the airport and you got 15 minutes to make a connection? You know, you're, you're on track to get to the gate and people are getting out of the way. You ever go to the airport and you got a three hour layover and you're wandering around and wasting time kind of being aimless in the process. So purpose is knowing where you're going and having some urgency to get there. And urgency is a, a good word to use with that because that actually sets a different direction. You know, I'm going to put um, in the blog that goes along with the podcast your links that you provided and such. Um, so Thank people you. have that as an access of they were driving and listening. We don't want to cause any subluxation, so they don't have to write those down. They'll they'll have those in the in the post. Um, what I would like to though is is there any last things you want to share of where people can get started with, ex, you know, expanding their philosophical knowledge and and getting in an applied direction. Well, obviously. Uh, you know, get to get to Mile High, uh, you know, the live event because, you know, I'll be there live and there's going to be a, a whole host of great speakers there that will stimulate your mind. Um, secondly, uh, I would go to philosophyformula.com. Um, there's, there's great free content there for you um, that, you know, can really, uh, you know, sometimes you think that the, the free content is just a tease, but these, these videos are like an hour long each. Uh, I go deep. Uh, so the whole 5P model I talked about, we do a whole hour on that. I do a whole hour on money. I do a whole hour on new patients. You do understand the relationship between your philosophy and new patients. So I would go get that and, and dig into that and it will get your, it will get your, your wheels turning and engage in the community. It's there because there's common threads underneath each of the videos. You can post, you can, you know, make, you know, share your own experience, ask questions. You can read other people's comments. There's tons of them. And then we'll alert you when we're doing webinars and webcasts and, you know, any, any courses, anything that we're doing, we, we can give you alerts on so that if you want to go further, you can. Um, so those would be the two, you know, main places. I think, you know, uh, you know, as far as for me, I go to philosophy for that's the place to get this content. Uh, if you want to look at my general business activities, you can go to actionpotentialholdings.com. It's not always current, uh, you know, as far as there's always new stuff going on that I haven't put there yet. But uh, nonetheless, that's kind of my, my general business world. But uh, I think for useful content for the listener, come live to, to Mile High, go to philosophyformula.com and, uh, and just start engaging your mind in these processes. Excellent. Uh, one last question. Top three philosophy books for someone to go grab? Wow. Okay. So, um, well, my top one philosophy book is, uh, you know, which is a fictional novel, which is uh, Atlas Shrugged. Okay. There we go. Um, and uh, that's, that's showing the practical application of philosophy and, in, 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 you know, on earth and the influence it has on, on human beings. Uh, I, I read the book. I'm, probably, I'm gearing up to read it again. I probably read it ten times. It's an 1,100 page book. You know, every couple of years, I like to read it again. Uh, but it's a very powerful book from one of the greatest minds of the last century. Um, the uh, and, and then I'm going to say, unfortunately, um, you know, and, and this is probably why I'm, I'm kind of pressed to write the book. The book that there's not a single book that really covers philosophy in the way that I'm describing it with with practical use or help, but I, but there's two other books. Ayn Rand's got a book called, it's a nonfiction book with a series of essays called Philosophy Who Needs It. Yeah. So you can read those essays and I think it would also, uh, you know, be something that would be stimulating to you. And then from the chiropractic standpoint, I gotta tell you, it's, it's a, it's a fairly easy read and still one of my favorite books that 1927 Stevenson's chiropractic textbook where, where the three, three principles is, I think it's a phenomenal read. I mean, it's 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 almost a hundred years old at this point, and it is an it, it's one of the greatest intellectual feats. Those thirty three principles in chiropractic history, I think, and as well as many other you know uh, really good things that are in there. Uh, so uh, I'm working on my book now. Uh, it's almost two books that are going to come out at once to be able to say everything I need to say. Uh, so you know, hopefully uh, I'll have announcements on that uh, sometime at the, toward the end of the year. But uh, it's a lot of work. You know, I can't I can't just write to get something out there it, it, unless I think it's the best book ever written. I don't feel good about it. So I, I, I've been laboring, <laughs> laboring with it because uh, I really do want to say something uh, original and, and something that's, uh, I think, going to be impactful. So I'd say, yeah, Alice Shrugged, uh, Philosophy Who Needs It, uh, Stevenson's 1927 chiropractic textbook, those, those would be a good start. Well, those are 
those are really solid starts for, for <laughs> sure. Um, and, and most chiropractic students and chiropractors never have touched those three. And if they did, it would definitely put their life in a, in a different direction. So um, I'm with you on those. So thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule for being on the Mile High Podcast. We are so excited to have you out here in August. Again, thank you for the political things you've done in chiropractic, especially in Colorado. Um, that's very near and dear to me because you, you helped us with those things. And um, uh, for people that have not etched it in stone in their calendar yet, August 17th to 20th in the Mile High State, be out here. It's going to be an incredible program, www.milehighchiro.org. And I will say this, uh, Patrick, um, when Stevenson – left Palmer. Do you know where he went? I don't. He went to the Mile High State. <laughs> he did. Perfect. He actually went to Boulder, Colorado. That's where he was Excellent. after he left Palmer. So look, follow the trail of Stevenson's there and, and uh, join us out here. So <laughs> um, uh, that's uh, pretty cool. So thank you again for being here. And if you like this podcast, share with others. And um, again, subscribe to the Mile High Podcast. We bring great chiropractic information to you each week. So have a great day. Uh, enjoy the mountains out there. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. I hope that we added some value to people's lives. Um, so thanks for watching. I'm sure we did. So have a great day, everybody, and keep, you know, changing spines and lives and minds. Like our page on Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Mile High Cairo.